Hi, and welcome to the Anti Waffle Podcast with me, M. Belshamela, and Marvin Gregorio and D'Souza. And together we will try to talk about research without any gobbledygook. Each episode we'll be talking to a researcher who will discuss the work they're doing, looking at why this research is important, and asking how did they get into this field. We hope that it will be informative and interesting and bring a bit of the academic world into the real world. This week we have Professor Andrew Hayward and Associate Professor Al Story, both from UCL. Hi, welcome. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for being here. Would you like to start by telling me a bit about your research? Yeah, we really wanted to talk today about a new research centre that we've just started up, which is called the Collaborative Centre for Inclusion Health. Uh, And this is really a research centre that focuses on looking at the health needs of socially excluded groups. Uh, So typically we'd be looking at the health of um, people uh, who've experienced homelessness, drug use, imprisonment, um, vulnerable migrant groups, etc. And so we've really tried to establish this group to understand the health needs uh, and how we can improve uh, health in these groups. Yeah, I mean, the the centre is is new in name, but I think it's probably uh, of note that Andrew and I have been working together for you know two decades now, and, uh, and in that time, I think our work has really really focused almost exclusively on um, looking at populations that have you know traditionally been described as hard to reach or underserved, etc. I mean, we don't particularly like either of those terms. Um, I mean, hard to reach is probably a term we'd apply to health services rather than people. Um, so I think the the centre really provides a natural sort of constellation for many of the people that we've met along the way and our own work. Uh, we've used a uh, number of uh, diseases, as it were, to as a lens through which to look at the issues that, 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 that we try and tackle through our research. And, and one that's been... Um, there from the beginning would be tuberculosis, which is a uh, we define as a social disease with some interesting medical consequences. And it's really a disease that uh, has put London on the map in terms of a, uh, a major international capital city, one of the wealthiest cities in the world, but still you know, leading Europe, leading Western Europe in terms of a disease that is really a disease of poverty and exclusion. Yeah, so when Alistair and I met... Um, forget how long ago now, but, uh, 15 years ago or so, um, one of the first research projects that we did was around looking at tuberculosis across London and trying to work out um, how much of a contribution um, people in uh, socially excluded groups made to it, so uh, how common homelessness, drug use, um, uh, migration, uh, imprisonment was in people uh, being treated for tuberculosis in London, because prior to that time, tuberculosis had largely been defined, if you like, as a disease of migration, whereas we could see that there was uh, actually a lot of homegrown tuberculosis going on with people finding it very difficult to access treatment services Uh. alongside relatively chaotic lifestyles. And so that first piece of research really showed that a very high proportion of tuberculosis in London uh, was in patients with these social risk factors that made it much harder to treat uh, tuberculosis because it's harder to get people engaged in what's a, at least a six-month course of regular treatment and a, and a long diagnostic pathway. And so it all really started from there. I did, and it was almost like a perfect storm emerging because the, I mean, TB is a disease that really is top of the list in terms of the global antimicrobial resistance agenda. You know, we're really losing the war against tuberculosis. There's parts of the world now where uh, strains of organisms that are resistant to the first-line drugs are becoming almost the norm circulating in communities. And lo and behold, we've seen the emergence of these really difficult-to-treat strains of TB in the same population groups who are finding it hardest to reach diagnostic services and take what we still ironically call short-course treatment. Um, I mean, the, the, the real eye-watering facts are that, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a fully sensitive strain of TB, you need six months treatment. If you've got a resistant organism, if we've lost particularly a wonder drug, rifampicin, um, if we've lost rifampicin, you're looking at about 18 months to two years of treatment. And that is a huge, tall order for anyone, let alone people who have, you know, got nowhere to live and, you know, really are, are finding it difficult struggling on the margins. When did you actually set up the centres? You said it's really well. The centre's only really been set up this year, but um, as Alistair was saying, it's it's really been based on this 
um, long history of research, um, and initially focusing on infectious diseases and how we uh, how we control infectious diseases in uh, socially excluded groups, and then uh, moving in to look at the broader health needs uh, of these groups. And it's just it's just recently that we've we've got the critical mass to um, turn this into a centre. Um, we've uh, been talking about it for a long time oh. to colleagues who are interested in this area, and we've been working with people to get fellowship uh, funding, for example, from um, NIHR, National Institute of Health Research, and from Wellcome for people to come and spend two or three years with us um, doing their PhDs uh, specifically in this area. Uh, so, so, And that's that's allowed us to really say, well, it's not just the two of us, we're a centre now. <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm, I'm I'm really with a clinical hat on because I'm I'm still, you know, if you saw my head off, it's like a stick of rock. It just says NHS, <laughs> and I'm I'm still 100% at the coalface clinical. This is my honorary honorary role. Um, that gives me, I think, quite a a different perspective in terms of the research research agenda, and and I suppose you know going back a few years. Based on the, the findings from our early work, which really put, for the first time ever, really, really put the, you know, the, the, the you know, the fact that a very s- relatively small proportion of all the cases, it was about one in six of all the cases of TB in London at that time, were either homeless or had problems with drugs and alcohol or had been recently in the prison system. That relatively small proportion, they were massively punching, punching above their weight in public health terms they were far more likely to be delayed diagnosis, so they were infectious, they transmitted, they were really ill on presentation, so there was a higher death rate, much higher death rate in that population from what should be a preventable disease. And, you know, back to the challenges of taking a minimum of six months of daily nasty toxic pills. So it, it was very clear that the service was broken. The services were really designed around that... 80-20 rule, you know, that kind of universal constant in all fields. So if you could recognise the symptoms and had the wherewithal to make it to a diagnostic service under your own steam, remain engaged with services for long enough to get a diagnosis and then take your carrier bag full of pills away and responsibly take them, um, you know, you were fine. But if you didn't fit into that category, there was, there was a real problem. And so sitting, you know, on your bar in a hospital, you know, waiting for people to come to you, I mean, those days are gone. And so we really wrote, rewrote the book. And, you know, with Andrew and, and, and many colleagues from many different disciplines, we, we've designed a, you know, a completely new service in terms of how to tackle communicable diseases in, 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 in people who were most likely to have them, basically. <laughs> yeah. is, this the, um, is it because of the social aspect? Why? Um, because I always thought that TB was gone, eradicated. Yeah. Yeah. It was gone and then it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, but people are still get. I thought that was all sorted. I thought that was all gone. It, so. it, it never went away. I mean, it, it, it declined to its lowest level ever. Uh, in 1987, 1988, right. and then we did that sort of classic thing, where what usually happens as a as a as a pathogen, particularly nears the the end point, as it were, in terms of elimination, it's not the the bug that that we get rid of; it's the entire program to tackle it oh. that we get rid of. Mm. And we did the classic thing that's been done oh, all over the world, all in, over um, the world. In New York, for absolutely. example, they had an absolutely massive outbreak of tuberculosis through the 1980s. And we were sitting here in London thinking, mm. well, there, but by the grace of God, go us. Mm. And that we're, we're going to get the same sort of um, outbreak happening here. And, yeah. and sure enough, we did. The, uh, the the epidemiology of it, the patterns of it, was a little bit different, but yeah. but largely it was about groups who were highly socially excluded. Yeah. Um, um, it was also coinciding a lot with the HIV uh, epidemic at the time, so we got this big kick in cases of TB um, at the time when people had been really disinvesting from TB services. Um, and so, you know, I think this is where research can be. Um, critical along with public health surveillance to you know monitor trends in disease monitor who's getting disease uh, and uh, and therefore you know think about what policies we can use to tackle it 
Um, as I was saying before, at that time, um, a lot of that increase was getting blamed on migration. It was kind of like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's somebody else's problem. It's not our fault. Um, That's right. Whereas... Yeah. Uh, put everyone in quarantine before they come in. No, I mean, well, the, 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 the <laughs> idea that we, we, the dogs. That we can control TB at the border, you know, yeah. and this was the nonsense of the argument. And, you know, the reality is, and, you know, not, not, not wishing to overblow our role, but it, it was Andrew and I who put, the social determinants of, of tuberculosis back on the map wow. and, and in doing so changed the actual surveillance system for the country nationally because you know that obsession with origin, ethnicity, site of disease mm. was irrelevant to actually trying to build better services yeah. for the future and you know when we did come up with a better service model which was you know there's nothing new under the sun we basically looked around the world we didn't need to look that, that far because over the water in the Netherlands they had a rather smart idea. They never got rid of mass mobile radiology like we did. Mm -hmm. We junked all the mass mobile radiology services as rates declined. It became not cost effective to screen everyone. And right. um, so we installed a deep fat fryer in most of those vans and parked them outside the Arsenal ground and that was the end of the service. <laughs> yeah, so back in the 19, 1950s, you know, after TB treatment became available, there was mass population screening using mobile x-ray vans. So they had whole fleets of these vans going around the country uh, for people to get screened and, and, and then put on treatment. Uh, and then sure enough, the, the rates of TB started to respond pretty well to that. Uh, and because it was no longer cost effective to do that screening, it was stopped. And so the idea here was that, well, okay, well, let's use the screening in the groups who need it, it most, um, target which we, which we found from this previous research. Mm. And so we could develop this mobile x-ray screening program, building on the ideas of the Dutch. Um, mm. But Al will tell you more about how we got the first <laughs> films done. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we we could have sat down and written a very you know long business case, and uh, you know had you know a hundred meetings, um, or we could just pop over there and nick one, stick it on right. a ferry, and bring it here. So we 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 we, we chose the, uh, the the latter option because it was uh, more bond like and, and more, more fun, <laughs> much more fun. So uh, we 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 borrowed it for a couple of days. Uh, uh, a, a wonderful Dutch physician called Rob van Hest c c came came with the unit, brought a few of his team with him, and I mean, it very clearly worked. You know, we found cases that wouldn't have turned yeah. up at hospital in a month of Sundays. I mean, wow. the, one of my questions is because you said it's hard to reach people. So how, how did you get these two well, of these? I people? mean, it's, this is the nonsense of it. I mean, you, the, the, we're, we're sitting here reading these documents about people, you know, who are hard to reach, and they're all written by. Um, mainly people who are, who are sitting in hospitals. <laughs> uh, but if you go into a, a hostel and yeah. you know walk up to the manager and say, you know, uh, I'd like to meet some of your hard to reach people, he'll say, What do you mean? I'm surrounded by them all day. Yeah. I can't get rid of them. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can't call them hard to reach. Are you mad? You know. So it's very clearly the services yeah. are hard to reach. So we simply stuck what's necessary for a diagnosis on on wheels, mm -hmm. and we now take it to the people. Uh, but in doing that, that, that again brings the research agenda into really sharp focus because you can't do anything um, in the NHS that's remotely different. You know, you can't stick your head above the parapet without drawing a bit of attention, as it were. Right. And people are rightly critical. And so I think we've been absolutely at the forefront in terms of um, knowing that we need to demonstrate effectiveness and being absolutely methodologically yeah. rich and robust in terms of making our data um, you know, real and apparent. So that was where, you know, so, you know, once once we got agreement for the initial funding for the mobile x-ray unit, you know, we really needed to evaluate how effective it was. And so that brings in a whole range of sort of research skills, both in, in terms of designing the studies that can uh, let us, for example, find out how much earlier people are getting diagnosed than they would have been diagnosed, and therefore thinking about how much transmission that might have averted. Uh, so if you diagnose people earlier, it stops them infecting other people. So we worked with mathematical modelers to um, to work out what that meant in terms of how many cases were saved and how much that was saving the NHS money. Um, and, and that sort of evidence, again, very, very closely linking the scientific agenda to the NHS agenda, was really critical to allow continued funding for oh. the 
uh, for the unit. Uh, and the outcome was very clear. Um, taking diagnostics to people in hostels, in day centres, in drug treatment projects, in prisons, yeah. taking diagnostics to where the cases are works. And we were great at engaging with them. And, you know, majority of the front end of the service is people who've got lived experience of being homeless, etc. Uh, but the, 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 the most stark finding was 53% of the cases that we found mm -hmm. and, you know, dutifully delivered for treatment were wow. lost. Nice. So we'd set up a service called Find and Lose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was very clear that we needed to... You know, take a, a, a far more proactive yeah. approach to supporting people to take treatment. And the service yeah. is now called Find and Treat. It does what it says on the tin. Right. And we get the same treatment outcome rates in the people who walk off that van as it is achieved in the general population. So the research kind of like led to the solution sort of thing, sort of like they, a... They've had to go hand in hand. No, so yeah, absolutely. They've had yeah. to go hand in hand. And, you know, Andrew and I are acutely aware of the fact that evidence is very nice, but uh, it's it's useless without advocacy. You, evidence mm -hmm. and advocacy go absolutely hand in hand if you want to actually make change and drive, you know, innovation in the mm -hmm. system. And for us, that was, um, you know, it was a great partnership, you know, for, 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 for many reasons. But, I mean, in terms of really embedding a research agenda, as you say, a real action research agenda into it. I think one of the takeoffs for us was when we were uh, fortunate enough to get a programme grant, we got uh, an, uh, quite a significant amount of funding through NIHR, and that enabled us to not only build in a range of other ideas around what we were doing with, with the actual service, but to really start to push the boundaries in terms of you know where where we where we should be taking communicable disease control in the twenty first century. Yeah, I mean these program grants are, are really good because they give you you know like <coughs> millions of pounds of funding and and a, and a long time you know like five years to really develop a whole program of research. Uh, in a specific area, and so we really, we did that around tuberculosis and hard to reach groups, and um, continued to improve the service and evaluate that. So, for example, studies of how we can improve uptake of the screening in hostels, how we can use um, people with a background in homelessness themselves to encourage people uh, onto the van and become involved in people's care, how we can. Uh, use peers to support people uh, in their journeys into treatment as well, uh, and and actually one of the oh, yeah, what was one of the other ones was, was well, comorbidity was a real sort of game changer in terms of one of the earlier studies we did because we were acutely aware of the fact that you know, you can't look at life through um, you know the, the the lens of a medical textbook and you know logical reductionism has basically reduced your body to either a couple of different organs that someone might be interested in or yeah. you know a couple of different pathogens that someone might be interested in but the defining characteristic of the population that we serve is the fact that they they've got a very early onset comorbidity they've got multiple and complex needs right. so they've got multiple physical issues and that's often uh, um, you know, you're seeing at the onset of some of the more chronic diseases in, in people who've be, been out there on the street very early on in life. So, um, and combined with a lot high burden of communicable disease. Yeah. And, and we look, one of the first things we looked at was this collinearity between the bloodborne viruses and, um, and tuberculosis. And we also looked at tuberculosis infection, which isn't really spoken about much. But when you actually put it in context, it's quite mind-blowing. I mean, let, let's say, for instance, if we think that, you know, uh, if I was to tell you that we found about a, a one, just about just above 1% uh, of the population had HIV, ooh, that's high. Yeah. Uh, and then we say, well, about, um, it was almost one in 10 had active chronic hepatitis C infection. But, wow. but, but we don't talk about TB in terms of an infection. We talk about TB when once you're coughing your guts up mm -hmm. and, you know, you're, 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 you're full-blown clinically ill. Mm. But TB has an infectious state that precedes it. And that data was terrifying. It was uh, one in three of the foreign-born people that we screened had yeah. TB and one in ten of the UK-born people had TB. Wow. Now, we look at the, the, the data from the most modern data in this country, which is from a new entrant screening program looking at latent disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're only screening people who've recently arrived from the highest burden countries in the world. They find 16%. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and 
we were finding one in ten of people yeah. who had no risk factors whatsoever and were UK born. So very wow. similar, but you know, it's transmitting different risk here. Factor, <laughs> transmitting here, um, and it's all not adequately ground. controlled. It's all home ground. And yeah. I mean, that, that's what explains the difference between that foreign born population mm. having a 16% rate of disease when you look at them through the lens of new entrant screening, and you look at them after they've been on the streets of London for a few years, yeah. and they've got 33% rate of positivity. So, wow. uh, you know, this is a pathogen that's found its niche in poverty and exclusion, and it's, you know, really, really transmitting. Was you know was doing a very good job of transmitting. One of our earlier papers was a, was a bit crazy as an idea, but it was completely panned out. We saw such um, high rates of TB in drug users, and we didn't really understand it. The again, this same study that put homelessness and drug use on the map was a massive uh, study in terms of the uh, number of cases and the response rate. It was nearly two thousand. Uh, cases involved in this study. Uh, not, that was a response rate of about 98% of the people who were currently on treatment in London at that time, which was amazing. All done through the London TB Nurses Network, who uh, um, you know such a phenomenal engine house. And we, it, we suddenly thought there's something going on here, because we had this massive outbreak of TB going on where the link was really prison and drug use, but nobody had really drilled into it. So we we had for the first time ever, good data in terms of what drugs people are taking. Mm. And it was crack cocaine. And no one really thought about it. And we, were, we, we, we published this in uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases many years before anyone was really thinking about it. But when you actually start to um, unpack it, it's such a clear biological driver of transmission. Mm-hmm. The cocaine itself, when you, when you try and smoke powder cocaine, it, it won't work. Um, it, it, it's uh, a drug that would just go up in smoke. Right. So you've got to basically cook it into rock cocaine. And rock, but rock cocaine itself has still got quite a low um, mm. temperature whereby it recrystallizes. So you have to smoke it through very short stem pipes and it hits your upper airway at about 80 plus degrees centigrade. And mm. because it's such a good anesthetic, it takes yeah. seconds to completely anesthetize your upper airway. And after right. that, you can't feel a thing. So you're, you're inhaling it really deeply and holding it. You're not wafting it around like a, a couple of fags. You know, you're really going for it because your money's burning in front of your face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're absolutely destroying your lungs. Yeah. Now we see people on the, on the, on the mobile health unit on, uh, taking x-rays on a regular basis of people in their sort of late 20s, early 30s who've got emphysema. You know, they've got really obvious chronic obstructive airways disease. Wow. And that's all crack related. Mm-hmm. But the, the real irony was this bug had found its niche in networks of people who congregate and smoke cocaine together. And that's why yeah. the prison risk factor was coming out. You know, epidemiology is a fascinating subject, but, you know, prison was a proxy for where this was happening. Mm-hmm. The transmission was going on in the community where people congregate to, 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 to use a lot of rock cocaine. And the prison was just basically a convenient place to find them. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, this pathogen has found its niche. It's Darwinistic, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't yeah. think of a, a, a... If the bug will always win, yeah? yeah. You've got to be pretty, pretty smart to get ahead of the bug. Yeah. And when we shared these data with uh, people from New York from the outbreak that Andrew was just describing earlier, they nearly fell off their seats because they, they'd missed it totally. And they yeah. went back and looked at their own data... And one of the real you know, correlates there was if they looked at cocaine arrests and the amount of cocaine that was being seized in New York, it almost perfectly correlated with the explosion in oh, TB and multidrug resistant TB cases. So um, almost by having them being arrested and put into that one place, it was making it worse as well. Well, the, the, the absolutely. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was difficult. So we started to look a little bit at how much. TB transmission there is actually in prisons and it's difficult to there's undoubtedly there is some Mm. but it's also um, you find a lot more cases of TB in prison because they're coming from um, these these backgrounds and I suspect a lot of the transmission was you know in crack houses overcrowded hostels um, day centers yeah, yeah you name poorly it. ventilated uh, and, and I think that's that's you know there's a big part of the problem of TB so we're talking about a, a group of people who are 
you know, malnourished, um, who are living in communal settings, uh, who have very poor general health as well, and and so that just allows TB to to, Thrive, to spread yeah. a lot. But you know, whilst we were doing this program grant, uh, looking at how to control TB and starting to look at other infections, we also started to think about well, okay, well, what are the other diseases? And so. You, like you say, we see, you see very, very high levels of respiratory disease, chronic obstructive airways disease, which is, you know, that's a that's a lifelong disease. You don't get rid of it. Um, you you just control it. Yeah. Um, as well as um, started to see really high rates of heart disease, um, pneumonia, um, uh, mental health, and and started to really think that okay, well, we've got this this amazing service where we can reach out to up to about 10,000 people a year and do TB screening. So but we really need to be doing more uh, mm. for that and not just focus on on one disease. Mm. We were doing it with this service, you know, I mean, just driving around London looking for one bug, you yeah. know, forget it. You know, we, 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 are the, we, we, we remain, you know, the one and only point of contact with the health system for thousands of people who are out there. Wow. And, and how you know, big is your team? Um, not big enough, I think, would be the first answer. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, lean and mean would be the second. Uh, it's stripped to the bone. You know, the, 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 it's the, you know, the hardest working health team. It's certainly the hardest working um, uh, health space in London, I would say. When you think of the size of that unit, uh, we put a new information system on, on the van just over two years ago. And you know, we've screened, we've screened nearly 10,000 people a year on that unit and managed many more off it. But... What really made me fall off my chair was we've seen over 170 different languages. Wow. In two years. Wow. London is a lens wow. onto the world, and That's that van crazy. is a lens onto the world within London. You know, yeah. there is another layer to London. You, yeah. You've got to scratch around a little bit, and there's yeah. a whole other layer to this, you know, wonderful low and no pay service economy that we all, we all need. Looking at the times when you've gone out and you know, searched for these... We're uh, always out. These yeah. easily found yeah. and findables. Um, <laughs> have there been any situations where you felt like you were in danger? No. No, I mean, everyone crosses the road to avoid people that we work with, but I, I went and presented in Boston quite recently, and uh, we calculated, because we have to fill out crazy crazy forms whenever there's anything, you know, s- slightly uh, um, risky goes on in the NHS. We have a Datix pr- pr- procedure. Um, and so the, the worst thing that, 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 that's ever happened on the van is sort of, you know, a, a, a bit of very minor pushing and shoving and maybe a little bit of shouting. Yeah. Um, so I calculated that as, a, as an event rate on the unit, and it turned out to be considerably lower than the homicide rate in Boston. So uh, <laughs> that's, uh, all, that's right, all you then. need to know, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we should compare all figures against. No, I, mean, I, would, I, would, I would go. I, I would go as far to say that you know the, there's so much stigma and misinformation about people who are, um, you know, people who are homeless and people who are you know who are suffering with exactly. you know, the Pe- people, are people, you know. people are people. People are people. I guess I was more thinking about yeah. the crack cocaine users. Well, would the, they not be? The, 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 the more bent crack violence. cocaine users, you, if they're if they've just sort of mm. you know had a hit you tend not to yeah. see them on the van you know and they're not hanging around that's true and they're usually on you know usually yeah. sitting in a nice confined airspace with all the windows shut coughing their guts up you know right and they're not saying well it's a bit smoking it should open the window <laughs> um the people that we do see increasingly out there at the moment who are you know in 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 the real throes of terror are you know i see lots of people smoking synthetic cannabinoid spice uh, there is tons of it out there. It's yeah. become an epidemic in London, and it's it's a bit. It shouldn't even be called cannabis. I mean, it's a bit like smoking glue. It's oh, solvent yeah. abuse, mm. uh, and it's absolutely debilitating. It's right. a, a horrific drug. Uh, I mean, you think of the harms associated with that. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it's just 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 crazy. Wow. Mm. But um, research. <laughs> yeah. Well, so research. Less exactly. drugs, more research. <laughs> but, but I think you're getting the idea that you, you know it's very important to us that the research is driven by practice and, and yeah. need. Mm. Um, but 
you know, through the research, you're starting to see this much bigger need, you know, and, you, and you're realizing, well, actually, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here. Sorry to m- mix my metaphors. <laughs> 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 scratching the tip of the eyes, but I like that one. Yeah, I'm going to use that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but but if we've got this, you know, sizable and growing population, and and you know, you just have to use your eyes to see that the homeless problem is growing substantially. Um, then, uh, all with these extraordinary high health needs, then what can be done about it, both in terms of preventing. Um, social exclusion in the first place uh, and and what can be done about this broader range of health needs uh, and integrating health and social care problems because if you just look at you know if you just treat the disease just treat TB and forget about the homelessness then yeah. you know they'll be back either with exactly. TB or something yeah. else or it's in, in mortuary so you, but, you've got to take a holistic approach but, to yeah. it and we've, we've challenged the definition of cure I mean, we've gone to the point whereby we've you know, we've, we've realised that you know biomedicine is great. You know, it can carve you up into a textbook, uh, but in terms of you know the uh, treatments and uh, you know interventions that are on offer, you know, it's fantastic. You know, if it was a bit more accessible to the people who needed it most, perhaps. But that aside, when we when we thought about you know TB, Hep C, etc., you, you, you say to someone, well, define cure for TB. And you know, we've got no test. I can't test you and say, oh, you know, you're, you're 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 cured. I can say, well, I think you took your treatment. Can't find a bug in you. Can't grow the bug, and you haven't got any symptoms. But if I've just you know picked you up out the gutter, mm-hmm. diagnosed you with TB, popped six months worth of pills gently down your neck, and then popped you back into the gutter, is that cured? And it's not, is it? We're going to have to. It's totally not the same environment. And the same for Hep C, and the same for most conditions. When you actually put it beyond that kind of narrow laser beam of biomedicine and start to look at it within the context of people, society, and epidemiology, I think you could challenge every every biomedical definition of cure. I mean, Hep C. What's the point of defining a cure for Hep C. for someone who's on the wrong end of a dirty pin two minutes mm-hmm. after they finish their treatment? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's got to encompass the social and behavioural determinants that put people at risk in the first place. Having said that, <laughs> we are. <laughs> oh, we're going to have an argument. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> taking your treatments really important. It's really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And, and in in the TB because. <laughs> Because people know it's so important, if, and if, if people don't adhere to their treatment very well, then they're much more likely to get drug-resistant TB, they're much mm-hmm. more likely to spread TB to other people, mm-hmm. they're much more likely to have worse clinical outcomes. Um, Bi, and, for instance. This, this is um, the no waffle post to science, isn't it? Right. So not worse clinical outcomes, die. <laughs> <laughs> more likely to die. More likely to die. And, and so... The, the way that WHO and around the world people have responded to this uh, is to introduce this thing called directly observed therapy, which is really where uh, every dose of your treatment, or at least um, three times a week, you're having your um, TB treatment observed by a healthcare worker or other responsible adult um, in order to ensure adherence. And so you can imagine that that's a pretty challenging thing for people to be coming into clinic all the time or healthcare workers to be going out to them all the time in order to achieve this Um, and so through this NIHR grant one of the things that we did was build on an idea that uh, Find and Treat had started which was this idea of video observed therapy for TB using a smartphone app um, instead of uh, having people come in and so we did a we did a trial where essentially we we randomised, uh, more or less at the toss of a coin, a bit more sophisticated than that, as to whether, <laughs> peop- whether people <laughs> would be offered this directly observed therapy or uh, video observed therapy using a smartphone. And this was largely in the sorts of groups we're talking about. Yeah, but uh, n- n- two thirds of them were either currently homeless, drug and alcohol problems, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, we went to the ethics committee and Andrew and I sat there and said, we're going to give everyone a smartphone. They said, you're mental. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so because they, they wouldn't that, all have that's access, my question, access to smartphones. Smartphone. So, so we thought, well, 
<laughs> it's got to be a lot cheaper to give people a smartphone than to pay for people to come into Absolutely. clinic three times a week, even if they do lose yeah. them mm. um, or sell them or whatever. <laughs> and in fact, most of the time people hung on to their smartphones because they, they valued them quite a lot. And yeah. we were able to, instead of them having their treatment intermittently, like three or five times a week, we were able to make sure that they had their treatment every day, which All is right. much better. We're twice uh, a day if yeah. they're drug resistant. Yeah. Uh, and we were keeping that up for six months for um, patients through treatment and finding it was way, way more effective and cost effective Acceptable. and that patients liked it much more um, than this standard directly observed therapy. Right. And, it, you know, if, we'll sure yeah. and it's been adopted by WHO and it you know, works all over the world. It's really a new tool in the box yeah. for you know, trying to support people to take yeah. tons and tons and tons of meds. I mean, back to what Andrew was saying about DOTS. I always do the honesty thing, you know, a short course of antibiotics is, what, five, ten days, yeah? And, you know, if you've got a room full of students, you say, well, how many people have ever failed to complete a short course of antibiotics? Most of them. Mm -hmm. This nonsense that people are just going to soldier on mm -hmm. when they're completely well, you know, the TB mm -hmm. symptoms resolve very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you you're conscious of the fact that the only, the only reason why you feel it is because your meds make you feel right. you know, itchy and they give you gastro gastro problems and they make you feel pukey. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people need support. People need support to take that treatment because they're actually doing us all a favour. They're doing, they're actually, you know, contributing their own risk, yeah. risking their own health as a public health gesture to us all. Yeah. And that's got to be valued and recognised. So we've applied that same thinking to many other areas that we work in now. And it's amazing how much of the learning we've been able to bring across from TB to Hep C to HIV. Right. Uh, and it's just a model that, that works. Yeah. You know, it's this mixture of research and advocacy, really. And, you know, there's no point in just doing a piece of research and expecting somebody to pick up on it. Yeah. And, and also, particularly with these populations, what we really felt was that they've been very much ignored in research terms and they're very much ignored in funding terms for what you do about the issue and so we wanted to to really get it on the map that um, this is a you know really an unacceptable problem in most rich countries yeah. so one of our next pieces of research with many many colleagues um, was to do a, a systematic review of all of the uh, published evidence from around the world of the uh, excess mortality uh, and morbidity, so death rates and yeah. illness in these overlapping groups of homeless people, yeah. drug users, uh, prisoners, and and also sex workers. And what we what we found in that was really shocking, but highly right. consistent across different countries. Was around a tenfold increase in death rates age oh, really? for age uh, in these groups compared to the general population. So that's... that's a And higher in women than men, which is the opposite mm. you find in, 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 in usual sort of uh, standardised mortality data. And that's, that's just a staggering rate. You know, most times when, as an epidemiologist, you're familiar with looking at, you know, relative yeah. risks and, <laughs> and, and the, you know, a good going one would be two or threefold. Yeah. Um, you know, for something like smoking and lung cancer, you might get a, that sort of level of increased risk. Yeah. Whereas this is way beyond. Um, and, and the other the thing scale. is that it's, it's across a whole range of diseases that, you know, pretty much every disease that you or I could get would be much more common in um, people in these socially excluded groups. And, and you know, back to that notion of off the scale, I mean, first and foremost, we wanted to make people who were invisible in routine health data visible. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, we wanted to compare their experience to people who were, you know, housed in inverted commas or were not, you know, uh, affected by addiction, etc., and the criminal justice system, and or survival sex. And we... It, we, we, we were really fortunate to be in this institute, really, because, I mean, Michael Marmot, Michael Marmot has been beavering away, you know, literally leading the world in terms of, you know, introducing the notion of that slope. And this has been demonstrated all over the planet. I mean, it's just part of the furniture now in public health teaching. You can yeah. see that quite clearly from Michael's citation index. And uh, it's just this idea that, you know, <laughs> 
<laughs> across from the richest to the poorest, you get this slope of increased uh, health problems and increased mortality rates. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a relative, you know, compared to this, it's a relatively gentle slope. So, say, you know, death rates between the poorest and the richest areas might, might be two or three about twofold different yeah. whereas we were talking about tenfold different here yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we really sort of reconceptualise that whole thing as not a slope mm-hmm. but it's like a cliff mm-hmm. it really is an absolute cliff edge as you yeah. wander down the slope index of inequality mm-hmm. from the richest to the poorest you know we lose the resolution to see the people that Andrew and I serve because they don't yeah. exist in these routine del- health data but when you put them on the map yeah. They're a cliff, they're a cliff edge right mm-hmm. on the end of it. And it's mind blowing, you know, the, the, the comparative mortality and morbidity in these po- in populations we serve is off the map. And this really has driven us. I think this the, this is a, one of the core concepts that really is, you know, one of those, you know, those nuggets, that little speck of dust that everything started to crystallize around. And that kind of slope and cliffs approach we've demonstrated on through multiple conditions, multiple issues across the health system now. And it really is one of the sort of defining features of our group. And I think, you know, going further, we, we you know, we've wrestled with the very idea of trying to define what our group is around. And we we feel it, it, it I mean it, it is an academic agenda, it is a research agenda, but it, it, more broadly it's it's a social justice movement. It's a group that's very inclusive. It includes people with lived experience. It includes people who are non-academic. It includes people from a, a huge range of different academic disciplines. And as I say, we you know we define it as that as as it, in public health terms, we consider um, inequity to be one of the most pressing problems of our day, uh, and it's just growing exponentially. You know, the last eight years of austerity, as Andrew alluded to earlier. We've seen unprecedented increase in the street population. Uh, They're just the front end of a massive issue in terms of homelessness. I mean, there's a lot going on in the background. We've seen the highest rate of drug-related deaths ever reported, um, enormous cuts to uh, services, drug treatment services, short start services, etc., particularly in the poorest areas. Again, the inverse care law ringing loud and true across there. And I think it's probably worthwhile giving a nod to, you know, a piece of work that really is, you know, really is an absolute s- central spine to um, where we're going with this whole agenda in terms of, you know, this is the visible consequences of extreme inequity and exclusion. But yeah. where does it come from? And uh, ace. Well, yeah, so, I mean, certainly if you look at a lot of literature and, and just from talking to people, you can see that, a lot of this arises in childhood, really, and it and it, and it comes from uh, both growing up in poverty is yeah. a, an enormous risk factor, but particularly uh, suffering adverse childhood experiences. So, for example, whether those be uh, physical or emotional or sexual abuse as a as a child uh, has a, an enormous um, effect on your likelihood of. Um, moving into homelessness, moving into the criminal justice system, moving into drug use. Um, uh, and similarly, sort of household level factors like um, mental you know, health, mental drug health addiction, in your family, incarceration. I mean, there's, 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 it's a very obvious list uh, and, and one that um, we felt was uh, very, you know, it, it was eye-watering and, and extremely significant, but all the literature that exists on this issue is individual, individually measured from people in surveys who've got lived experience themselves of having an A score, as it were. Mm-hmm. And we felt that was, you know, that's important literature. But in terms of actually developing the concept into an advocacy agenda, we've, we've basically taken ACE as, 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 as a concept and tried to apply it to a population level. And, and it works. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, this is something that will be coming out this year. And you know, the whole idea is to, you know, rather than sort of thinking of indices of deprivation as a means to, um, you know, target resource, you know, universal proportionalism, I mean, basically communities that are, um, you know, suffering the most extreme forms of deprivation, they need targeted interventions in terms of, you know, and targeted interventions cost money. 
Um, but IMD, in, it, which is the usual index of multiple deprivation that's used, it's not sensitive enough to really pick up on, you know, the the experience, the experience of trying to grow up in these communities. And yeah. perhaps most importantly, it's not sensitive enough to sort of manifest change that's, that's actually going to be... Um, timely in terms of politics yeah? yeah and we've seen many examples of politicians getting off the hook because the social impacts of their policies are measured years later mm-hmm. uh, after they're long gone into the boardrooms of some other company or joined mm-hmm. another bank yeah. and uh, I mean the reality is we want to develop systems that actually can hold our political leaders to account yeah. and and children um, we, we used to think of homeless people almost like the canaries in the mine because their death rate was so staggering and high in comparison to um, the general population and they would manifest extreme forms of ill health. Um, and that was responsive to policy in some ways. We could see it. You, know, you can see you know, amongst drug users, you can see it. Um, but children are the, the real canaries in the mine. And children are um, you know, the future. And the reality is... Wandering around saying, you know, oh, homelessness, oh, drug use, it's very terrible, it could happen to anybody. I mean, that's, you know, that's codswallop. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reality is for a high proportion of people who end up out there, mm-hmm. um, their trajectory has been quite clear and preventable. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, it's, it, it's very interesting when the the scientific agenda around uh, social inequalities and particularly social exclusion, mm. uh, you know, I think it it has to abut with politics to to a point because, um, you know, there are political determinants of health um, and uh, a, a lot of it is about how we choose to spend the money and distribute the money that we've got uh, in order to tackle these big social problems. Uh, and so I suppose... I mean, maybe naively, but one of the things that we're hoping is that if if we can measure the determinants of homelessness and social exclusion, i.e. adverse childhood experiences, and if we can measure that in local areas uh, and highlight the areas that are doing really poorly, then maybe they won't shut down the children's centres and the Shore Start centres in those areas. Maybe yeah. they'll, yeah. They'll, they'll stop disinvesting yeah. uh, at such a rate in, in the services that can help to prevent uh, these yeah. problems. The, that the, are yeah. evidence-based and, and, um, and, and yeah. very clearly of, of, of high value. And, and therein lies you know, a challenge that we've faced across our entire um, you know, research agenda. Um, Spend now, save later has been a difficult concept in the last few years, particularly in the face of austerity. Uh, And, you know, I really feel for health uh, economics as a discipline because it's kind of gone out the window. Mm -hmm. No one really wants to listen to um, a a, a rational, reasoned argument about something's cost effectiveness. Um, The the system, unfortunately, is being reduced to two-column bookkeeping on a 12-month cycle. (laughs) Uh, And that's very damaging it's very dangerous but it won't always be like that these things move in cycles Andrew and I want to be at the forefront in terms of trying to expose the folly of that of that mindset and unfortunately most importantly the harms so So, so your ultimate output output of your centre what would it be what would you it's it, again, but comes back to you know. I mean, it's almost like being homeless, isn't it? When you're a researcher who's interested in stuff that they don't think anybody else is. So uh, <laughs> we'll try and be a home for people who share our values and for people who want to use good, good evidence, good research to actually, um, you know, complement the advocacy arguments, and make a difference. Uh, you know, we, we're always on the lookout for a strap line, aren't we? And, you know, science likes things like sort of like molecule to man, etc. And we were discussing the other night, you know, perhaps our strap line should be, you know, bench, as in bench science, yeah, to bench, yeah? Huh? As oh. in bench to park, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's where you go with that. <laughs> if you... So you want people to be interested and be part of it, is there a way well, we, that we, people could we be? Want, we want people to who are interested in conducting high quality research uh, in social exclusion, both in the prevention of it, what we can do to that, and uh, and what we can do to better 
um, serve people who've already fallen into that, which a lot of the time is is about how we get the health services to work better with the uh, with housing services, Absolutely. for example. And so a lot of our projects are very very practical, and they're they're. They're practical, the looking at evidence and care pathways. So, for example, we're doing projects on um, telemedicine in prison. So if you're in prison, it's quite hard to get out to go to a hospital <laughs> for an outpatient appointment, which okay. is a form of exclusion in itself. So mm -hmm. people are not getting their health needs met. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at how we can do that better mm -hmm. with um, telemedicine. Right. Uh, we're looking at how um, people who use drugs um, make use of uh, health services, the, which specialties they're mainly going to, what the pathways are, how we can improve those mm. pathways. And often, you know, so for example, in, in drug use, people just focus on, the, on that uh, and, then, and maybe they'll get on to think about mental health, but they'll ignore uh, all of the, the other physical health problems that, they, uh, that they're suffering. And so you need different models of care to be able to tackle that. And so it's that sort of research is well, a lot of what we're doing. And, and there's a huge community dividend there. Um, we, we design, uh, we co-design, should I stress, and implement really innovative ways of trying to provide better services for people. Mm -hmm. And we do it for a population who a lot of people would think it would be impossible to do that with. Because, oh, they weren't calm, they weren't engaged, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it works. And if we can do it there, you know, I, I take a better standard of TB and HIV diagnostics in the streets of London than they achieve in any hospital here. Right. Um, and that's just one example of many. The community dividend is huge. But I think the other, you know, the other thing that we haven't really said that's, that's really important about the only way you can really succeed in this is when you're designing these services to do it alongside with, with people with so we so we talk about a lot in science about the concept of you know patient and public involvement in science and yeah. um again most people would say to us well you can't do that with these groups because they're too difficult to talk to they're not they're just normal people um who have they have the best ideas about how we're going to solve these problems. For example, you know, that idea we were talking about with the video observed therapy, that really came from a, a user yeah, who totally. basically saying, well, why yeah. don't you do it like this? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, in this, you know, part of this concept of inclusion health is, is really including the in affected communities with, within it's this research Right, back to the well. HIV you know, uh, agenda, you know, nothing about me without me. You know, the, the reality is I couldn't run, find and treat without people who've got lived experience of mm. being out there. They are the greatest resource to uh, the find and treat service that, mm. that, that we have. Um, I can't, you know go and recruit those people from a university or put an advert in, in, you know, in, 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 in a science journal. Uh, you can't yeah. teach what they know. It's mm -hmm. lived experience, it's real experience. And that again lies in the heart of what we, we're trying to achieve in the agenda. Um, the, the people who are most aware of the need for better services, i.e. people who've experienced the hard end of exclusion, um, they are central to the solution. They are mm -hmm. they are essential mm -hmm. and central to the solution. There's there's been way too many um, smart ideas imposed on systems that are more than capable of uh, sorting out their own problems. Yeah. And and again, that, that you know that comes right back to where our agenda is. It's inequity. We just want to funnel the resources, and it's not massive amounts of money, we want to funnel the resources necessary to prevent the extreme harms of exclusion to the communities that need them most, who already know what to do with them. But that requires evidence, and that requires advocacy. And what can the general public do? There's, there's an awful lot of excellent charities and third sector organisations that kind of, you know, their raison d'etre is to deal with these uh, uh, issues in a professional way and you know that's in a way that's part that's partly my response is that by supporting those um, charities uh, and thinking about them understanding yeah. which ones are good which ones which ones chime with that's a good way of doing it um, I, I think everybody finds it heartbreaking walking past homeless people all the time and I know yeah. 
it, it's difficult to respond all the time. You know, yeah, I think shit, for yeah, us, a lot, of, yeah. a lot of why we do this is to make us feel better about. <laughs> about no, absolutely, but, no, it's all it's all massive guilt trip. No, I mean, I think the it, my, my stock answer to that is is usually that um, it, we all get an opportunity to talk to people, yeah, yeah. and you, you don't need to travel that far uh, out of this building to find someone who genuinely doesn't make mm-hmm. a connection between uh, austerity and equity mm-hmm. and people on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's that's fair right. to you know blame people for their poverty. Right, yeah, no. um, and I think you know a, a huge part of the movement is about trying to get people to have honest conversations with everybody they know every available opportunity right. <laughs> until we start to shift the Overton window, you know, yeah. the political lens through which this issue is currently viewed right. back into a, uh, a domain that's more humane. Thank you very much to Andrew and Al for talking to us today and thank you very much to everybody for listening. We'll put links up on our website which is antiwafflepodcast.wordpress.com and our Twitter account which is at antiwafflepod. Please do get in touch as we'd love to hear from you. Bye.